the search for Donna Rubison's sister really led to this discovery of doxorubicin, which is an analog with much greater activity. So the discovery of doxorubicin can be coined kind of as one of the best drugs born in Milan, Italy. And after that, a few analogs were developed and tested. And two that we currently use today are idorubicin and epirubicin. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Manager of Oncology Nursing Practice at ONS. And today we're talking with Pooja Patel, Clinical Oncology Pharmacist at the Del Nor Hospital Northwestern Medicine Cancer Center in Geneva, Illinois, about anthracyclines and other anti-tumor antibiotics. This episode is part of a series about anti-cancer drug classes, which we'll link to in the episode notes. As a reminder, you can earn free NCBD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've also linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Pooja. Thanks for having me. So to start off today, could you give us a brief overview on just the history of anthracyclines in the field of oncology? Sure. So anthracyclines were first isolated as antibacterial agents, believe it or not, in 1939. And in 1958, the CEO from Pharmitalia and the director from the National Cancer Institute in Milan they signed this research agreement for kind of discovering new natural anti-tumor agents. And so from an Italian soil sample, Streptomyces pusaceous, which is a soil fungi found near the Castle del Monte in Italy, um, they discovered the original anthracycline, donomycin, which is also known as donorubicin. And then donorubicin later went to go become the first approved anthracycline in acute leukemias. And as you can imagine now, Jamie, you know, you have this wave of interest in identifying more agents in this class with a focus now on solid tumors. And so the search for Donna Rubicin's sister really led to this discovery of doxorubicin, which is an analog with much greater activity. And now it has, it's approved in solid tumors. So now we were able to do liquid and solid tumors. So the discovery of doxorubicin can be coined kind of as one of the best drugs born in Milan, Italy. And after that, a few analogs were developed and tested. And two that we currently use today are idorubicin and epirubicin. I just always find that so fascinating that, you know, in the early stages of identifying these types of agents, this was also predating, you know, our full awareness and understanding of the biology of cancer and how it developed. Like we were just kind of tried whatever we could find <laughs> to see what would work. And so, you know, as I've read other books and just kind of learned about some of the history of oncology, it always just is, I find it very fascinating that as you've just described, like it was just sort of found and kind of stumbled upon and helped kind of lead to these other subsequent developments, but it was sort of a bit happenstance. So I, I just think it's very fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of the penicillins of oncology. <laughs> right. So let's talk about the mechanism of action. Can you talk a little bit about that when it comes to anthracyclines? Sure. So first of all, um, kind of thinking about the category, anthracyclines are kind of categorized as topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. And these agents are very powerful in that they have, it's really like three drugs in one. And they have various mechanisms. I'll go over three with us, with our listeners today. So topoisomerase 2 inhibition. So what kind of is the function of topoisomerase 2? And in order to under, understand that, I have an analogy about thinking about these old, you know, the corded telephones that we used to have. Now, the function of topoisomerase is to unwind DNA and then rewind it. So now take two of those cords, those old telephone cords, pair them up because now we're matching base pairs. And think about how that cord kind of dangles. It's really tight. It's kind of really coiled up. And that's how DNA structure is normally comfortable at sitting at. It's a super coil. Now, if we want to replicate, go in and replicate each of these sections of this particular cord, we need to create a stable environment. And so we actually cut one of the cords. And that's exactly what topoisomerase is doing. It's cutting one of the DNA strands. 
And in this case, it's cutting two strands, and that's why it's called topoisomerase 2. So it's cutting both of the strands. It's cutting the DNA, releasing some of that tension, allowing for replication, and then rejoining that portion. So it's a very important enzyme. And it'll go about doing this for the entire strand of DNA. It's fascinating. So it's allowing for DNA really to replicate in a relaxed manner with no structural strain. What scientists discovered is that if you stabilize this particular enzyme with DNA and don't let it move along, then it can't rejoin and this eventually leads to double-stranded breaks. We have a nice visual. I have a nice visual representation that was just published with myself and uh, my previous resident in October 2023 titled Nursing Implications with Regimen with the Regimen R Chop in the Clinical Journal of Oncology. And there's a really nice figure in that article that kind of helps illustrate this specific mechanism of action. The other second mechanism is kind of the effect on DNA. So you'll come across reading the term DNA intercalation. So what does that word mean? When you take the word intercalate, the definition of it means intrusive inserting of something in an existing series or sequence. And the analogy that I could think of here is simple. It's thinking about too many passengers squeezing in the backseat of your car. There could be safety issues, there's weight issues, there's instability, maybe while driving. And that's what this doxorubicin is, is doing. It's sliding right in between the base pairs of the DNA double helix, destroying hydrogen bonds between those two bases, which then change the shape of that double helix. And by changing the shape, topoisomerase 2, which we just talked about, can no longer go in and bind to DNA. It can't relax that supercoil. And so DNA synthesis, synthesis doesn't happen. And then the third mechanism, which you might see, is the generation of free radicals. And in the presence of oxygen and metal catalysts like iron, doxorubicin can undergo metabolism to this semi-quinone radical. And it just means that there's like this unpaired electron. And when you think about it, unpaired electrons are extremely reactive. This particular molecule reacts with oxygen to create superoxide. And that the superoxide radical is what undergoes and does several reactions, eventually leading to cell death. So kind of summarizing all of these mechanisms, these three mechanisms, and there's more. Topoisomerase summaries two catalytic activity. That's that two tightly wound phone cords that can no longer replicate leading to perhaps the extinction of the molecule or the phones. Intercalation with DNA, which is kind of that extra passenger in the car leading to instability. And then generation of oxygen intermediates. And that's that electron that's just bouncing around a pinball machine causing damage. Thank you so much for that explanation. And I love the examples, the visuals that you help us create so that we can kind of link the concept with something that maybe is a little bit more memorable, but that's a really great way to break down and explain just how these drugs work. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about the some of the, maybe the primary subclasses of the anthracyclines and if there's any examples you can highlight or of some newer agents. Sure. So the subclasses here are based on the naturally produced anthracyclines. So we have donorubicin, doxorubicin, we have idorubicin and epirubicin, which are analogs, meaning they differ only slightly in chemical structure. And then there's an, an agent called mitoxantrone, and that's an anthracene dione. It's structurally different from anthracyclines, but it's kind of grouped in this class. And then we have pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, where doxorubicin is confined in liposomes that are coated with this polyethylene glycol to resist degradation by the endorecticular system. And then a newer agent is the combination agent of liposomal donorubicin and cytarabine. And this kind of provides a, a synergistic impact in cellular killing. That's interesting. And so these have been around for such a long time, and yet new agents are still being kind of developed or, or reimagined of kind of packaging these older drugs in new ways to deliver them differently. Absolutely. So what are some of the common toxicities or adverse events that we should typically expect or associate with anthracyclines, both if they're given as individual single agents or if they are given in combination therapy? Sure. So the main toxicity that well, our listeners might be familiar with is cardiotoxicity. And I'll start with cardiotoxicity from breaking it down a little bit. There's an onset that occurs during treatment or even years to decades, and that's kind of this delayed cardiotoxicity. 
Signs and symptoms of acute cardiotoxicity could vary from EKG changes, present as tachycardia, tachyrrhythmia. Delayed cardiotoxicity is you know, anything from heart failure to left ventricular ejection fraction decrease. And then when thinking about cardiotoxicity, there's two classifications. So type one and type two. Type one agents are dose dependent and irreversible, cause irreversible cardiac damage. And type two agents induce reversible cardiac damage. And anthracyclines belong to this type one category. So the way I kind of created a mnemonic is doxorubicin did it. So it's DDI, which is dose dependent, irreversible. And you can also change that I to think about type one. So you can remember there's a difference between type one and type two types of cardiotoxicity. There's also myelosuppression with this agent. And there is dose dependent, it's dose dependent and reversible. And when you administer it on a three week schedule, the nadir typically occurs between 10 to 14 days with a cell recovery at about 21 days. Tissue necrosis and extravasation is something else that we do think about with this agent. And secondary malignancies such as AML, MDS may present um, within one to three years of treatment. And then highly, this agent is doxorubicin specifically is highly emetic in combination with cytoxin or when the dose is greater than 60 milligrams per meter squared. So that's kind of specifically doxorubicin. If I go, if I can discuss maybe about doxil next, doxil would be some things to kind of think about are may cause acute infusion related reaction. About 11% of patients with solid tumor would have this type of reaction. 10 foot syndrome, usually seen maybe after two to three cycles. It's noted that doxil should not be substituted for doxorubicin. It's a low emetic risk agent. Then the next agent would be epirubicin. Epirubicin, similar toxicities, nausea, vomiting is high with combination of cytoxin or 90 milligrams per meter squared or less than 90 milligrams per meter squared is considered moderate emetic risk. And then the mitoxantrone, which is kind of that subclass, which is an anthracene dione, and the nausea vomiting risk is low for this agent. It could cause hypersensitivity reactions and it's an irritant. And of note, this particular agent is blue in color and the other agents are kind of this like reddish color. And so when you're thinking about overall class effects, cardiotoxicity, myelosuppression, mucositis, alopecia, radiosensitization, body fluid discoloration, everything will turn red except for mitoxantrone, which will be blue. So you're thinking urine, tears, extravasation. The only ones that are irritants are mitoxantrone and liposomal uh, doxorubicin, the rest are vesicants, and then secondary malignancies. So that kind of sums up specific anthracycline-related toxicities and then class toxicities. So it sounds like all of the most terrible side effects that we can cause, this class of drugs causes all of them potentially, which is what we know. I mean, these are these older drugs that are not specific. They do have a lot of those risks that come with them. And so when, when we're engaging with our patients and, and trying to teach them about their new therapy, these are the ones that they always think about. And so thankfully, some of our newer agents, more specific targeted therapies don't include a lot of these. But as we've discussed, these therapies are still being used frequently, certainly in, in certain disease states. They're still part of kind of your frontline therapies and, and some of those foundational therapies for certain diseases. So these are still very much in practice. And so it's important for nurses to just have the awareness of how dangerous these symptoms and side effects can be for patients if they're not proactively addressed or you know patients aren't given the right information to be able to report what they're experiencing. But thank you for kind of summarizing all of those really big, important toxicities that nurses just need to be aware of. Sure. And like you said, they are this, these are his, kind of historical drugs and they're foundational drugs and they're probably not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's really important, like you said, is just to really know how to treat and understand the side effects. So let's talk a little bit about that. In terms of pharmacologic strategies to prevent or to manage toxicities, what are some of the typical agents that we see? Sure. So some of the preventing and monitoring um, is really important for cardiotoxicity. And we're looking for baseline ejection fractions before giving anthracyclines. A general threshold for monitoring left ventricular ejection fraction would be 50% that we're kind of maybe happy with. We're worried about heart failure in these patients. So we might see EKG changes, we might see LVF changes, and we're 
kind of tracking these agents based on what is called as a cumulative dose tracking or a lifetime dose. So all of these agents have specific lifetime maximums that we need to be aware of. And there are some risk factors. So some patients can actually be at higher risk for some of these cardiotoxicities versus other patients. And I think it's important to kind of know those too. So ASCO has a great publication on kind of identifying those. And some of the aspects would be high-dose anthracyclines, doxorubicin greater than 250 milligrams per meter squared, or high-dose radiation therapy. Or if you're being treated with a lower dose anthracycline, which is doxorubicin less than 250 milligrams, and you have any of the two following risk factors, so smoking, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, or you're older in age, or perhaps you have a compromised cardiac function, you're at greater risk for developing these cardiotoxicities. An example that I've had in, in my clinic is, you know, I've identified some of these patients that have these risk factors and we go in to have a little bit more aggressive monitoring for the echocardiogram or MUGA. And when we put in those orders, we often get denials from insurance. And those are kind of, we submit the guidelines and kind of appeals to help those patients kind of proactively realize if we're putting them in a greater cardiac risk. And so that's kind of the monitoring aspect. And if a patient does receive doxorubicin, cumulative dose greater than 250 milligrams per meter squared or greater. The PI actually says 300 milligrams per meter squared, so it depends on your institutional policies. But then there's an agent called dexterazoxane, which is used for cardiac toxicity prophylaxis. And it's dosed a little unique. It's dosed at 10 to 1 ratio of dexterazoxane to doxorubicin. And here you're really monitoring if patients do achieve that higher cumulative dose, then you would give them dexterazoxane. Now, Treated with doxorubicin, I've had patients, they were treated maybe 10 to 15 years ago with these agents because we just talked about how, how long they've been around. Now they have a different disease, which gold standard, for example, I had um, a lymphoma patient where gold standard was doxorubicin, and they had been treated with AC previously. So we would be hitting that 300 milligrams per meter squared lifetime dose pretty soon. So we decided, you know, that question of should we be giving dextrazoxane as a preventative medication kind of comes up when you're discussing this kind of case. And then the other aspect is this extravasation. So doxorubicin, because we talked about it, it does bind with the DNA. It is a vesicant. It can cause this effect to surrounding cells because it's in the DNA of all cells. It's not cell specific. So we need to immediately, if a nurse experiences, ex sees extravasation, we localize and neutralize. So localize, meaning immediately stop that doxorubicin, apply an ice pack. So think about doxorubicin is red, ice is blue. So think about that contrast. And then you can actually give dextrazoxane, which is the same agent that I just talked about, as a neutralization. It has to be given within six hours of doxorubicin extravasation. The dose is different from the dose in the cardiotoxicity prevention use, and it needs renal adjustment. But, you know, those are, that is the main medication that can be given for very different side effects that can occur. And I think that's very interesting. I mean, I, I appreciate that point you brought up in terms of the, you know, the maximum lifetime dosage and how, you know, because some of our therapies are becoming more effective, people are living longer. Sometimes they are unfortunately getting a secondary cancer later in life life perhaps completely unrelated to their original cancer. But when these two disease states have drug regimens that include these anthracyclines, you're exactly right. You have to be aware of was their treatment before. And if it was a long time ago, you know, they might not remember. Maybe the records, you can't locate them. And so I think that's an important point for nurses to consider of, you know, just being aware of the patient's history and making sure that question gets asked of, you know, have you had a prior cancer diagnosis? What kind of treatment did you receive? Those are important parts to uh, include, and especially if there's calculators and things in the medical record that are trying to keep that cumulative lifetime dose, just making sure that the right information is being incorporated and added to that so that that information is reflecting an accurate history for that patient. Absolutely. And, you know, the patient thing I'm specifically thinking about, you know, fortunately, they were treated at our location about 10 years ago, but since our EMR had changed several variations, we didn't have those exact records. And so I always advocate for patients is when you're 
given these drugs, you know, do the survivorship protocol and write down or maybe print out all of those documents for exact doses, right? Where if there were dose reductions, maybe we could could have gone up in that doxorubicin dose. So I agree. Keep those records. Keep paper is still with us. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. So kind of going back to you were talking about the, you know, the risk for extravasation and, w- and with this drug or with the anthracyclines, you know, as a vesicant. So let's just talk a little bit more about that and the considerations, for example, for intravenous access that nurses should keep in mind when we're administering this class of drugs to our patients. Sure. So I think that one of the biggest things is for nurses to kind of look over their policies for administration for vesicants and specifically checking blood return for these agents because many of them are given, you know, IV push. So checking blood return every two to five mLs is really important to make sure that you are in the right space. And then these agents, some of them can also be given continuously. So you're thinking about, you know, first of all, you should have a central line in for these agents because they're vesicants. But if it's been given continuous, there is something that's called this anthracycline streaking. And it's not the same as an extravasation. So I, I think being... De- being able to decipher the difference between the two is is really kind of comes with experience. Absolutely. And you made it, you know, a great point. You know, we have to be aware and consider, you know, what is the infusion time for these drugs? Is it a push versus is it an infusion over time? Is it continuous for more than 30 to 60 minutes? All of those things impact the line that should be administered. You know, certainly anytime a central line can be used to give a vesicant, it see it is the ideal. But the reality is that sometimes that's just not possible. And so there still are, you know, guidelines and recommendations, you know, in our ONS guidelines of how to give those these agents safely. But you're absolutely right. Checking for that blood return, remaining with the patient, you know, having visibility to the insertion site. And more important than anything, communicating with the patient of, you know, what they need to alert of if they start to have a, a sensation or pain or just notice something is different at that IV site when these drugs are infusing. And that's critically important so that, you know, as nurses and pharmacists, we can react quickly to stop that infusion and perhaps, you know, provide that antidote if needed. Yes, I think awareness is is really essential. And thankfully, you know, thankfully or not, I guess you are with the patient for this entire time, right? Because you're pushing every two to five mLs, you're, you're checking. So it's a very kind of intimate experience in and of itself. So I think just being very vigilant is very important. So let's talk just a little bit about patient education. What would you say are some of the primary points that we should be communicating with our patients or their family and caregivers about anthracyclines? Sure. So education points kind of summarizing some of the adverse events I talked about earlier, but informing them about signs and symptoms of heart failure and what that might look like. So maybe dyspnea, are you having shortness of breath, just going up and down the stairs, or is there edema? Is that something that they are seeing now, um, sleeping up with pillows, you know, things like that, tachycardia. I think you were absolutely correct in terms of self-advocacy for for the actual administration part of for anthracycline extravasation. So if there is a burning sensation, that means it's leaking under your skin and we have to know that. So I think that's really important to tell them to speak up. The other aspect is that can be kind of scary if they don't know about it is this urine discoloration or tears maybe one to two days after treatment. So based on which agent you get, that might appear. And then one that I've seen a lot of patients kind of talk about is mouth sores that they present. So I think anthracyclines, you know, mucositis is a big aspect too, and kind of detailing them what precautions they might take. Um, In the C. John paper that I mentioned earlier, there's doses of how to treat that specifically. But I think just awareness, because I've had too many patients that unfortunately just, you know, have declined because of mouth sores that could have been prevented. And, you know, once I remember one side effect, of course, you mentioned was high hemorrhagic potential causing severe nausea and vomiting. But I just always think it's interesting to reflect and realize that that is one of the side effects that we actually, you know, with the right preventative medications and the right post-administration medications at home, uh, we could control that fairly well for patients. Not perfectly, but certainly not the way it was before some of these newer agents that were developed for nausea and vomiting. So that is one side effect that thankfully we can certainly make our patients aware of, but also provide some reassurance that, you know, with 
taking the right medicines on the right schedule, that hopefully we can minimize that to the point where it's maybe just a nuisance and not something that is truly impacting their daily life. Right. And and kind of taking that stigma away that this should cause emesis, right? I think they empowering them that this really shouldn't. And if it is, then ask your pharmacist or nurse to help you with better control of that. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on to some other of the anti-tumor antibiotics. Can we maybe first elaborate just on some of their primary indications and then maybe move into the mechanism of action? Sure. So thinking about the agents in this class, we'll be talking about four agents and it's they are bleomycin, dactinomycin, mitomycin, which are isolated from the streptomyces species, and then trabectidin, which is isolated from a marine species. And now thinking about bleomycin and its indications, it's primarily in- indicated in Hodgkin's lymphoma, germ cell tumor, ovarian testicular cancers. Dactinomycin is used for Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. Mitomycin is used in bladder cancer and anal cancer. And trabectidin is primarily used in soft tissue sarcoma and ovarian cancer in the relapsed setting. So thinking about their mechanism of action, I'll focus specifically on bleomycin here. So bleomycin binds to DNA in the presence of oxygen and some sort of iron-like metal. It produces these oxidative reactive species, which then form radicals and liberated electrons, where we talked about those unpaired electrons. And they will go and attack this phosphodiester bond of DNA, which eventually leads to single or double-stranded DNA break. Specifically, they do work in G2, so leading to G2 cell arrest in the cell phase cycle, but they are considered cell nonspecific drugs, so specifically bleomycin. The other agents, they all kind of work against DNA or RNA in some sort of manner. Daptomycin inhibits RNA and protein synthesis and prevents transcription of single-stranded DNA. Mitomycin is alkylating DNA, and trabectinin is also an alkylating agent, and it kind of works in the minor groove of DNA, causing further downstream effects and apoptosis. And so how does that mechanism of action in the pharmacokinetics influence how we dose and administer these, these types of drugs? Yeah, so to talk about bleomycin here, for example, kinetically, Two-thirds of this drug is eliminated renally. And so we would think that there would need to be renal adjustments if you know there's renal changes. So for creatinine clearance greater than 50, there are no renal dose adjustments. But after that, every 10 ml per minute decrease in GFR, there are dose reductions that re- are required. And this drug in particular has a lot of gradations in terms of renal do- dysfunction that I've seen. Bleomycin is also very unique because it's degraded by this enzyme called bleomycin hydrolase. And this specific enzyme is not present in large concentration in two places, in the skin and in the lung. So kinetically, we'll be talking about I think side effects and thinking about the kinetics is important there. So now let's move on to some of the common toxicities and the adverse events that we see with the anti-tumor antibiotics. Can we talk about those and also maybe any pharmacologic strategies that we use to prevent or manage them? Sure. So thinking about some of these common toxicities, I'll we'll start with bleomycin here. Bleomycin can have this bleomycin-induced pulmonary toxicity. Now, often you might see it in, your, in literature as BIP, and its risk increases with age greater than 70. It also has a cumulative lifetime dose. So the cumulative lifetime dose is actually 400 units, but the risk of pulmonary toxicity de- increases anything over 300 units. Risk factors also for this toxicity are prior radiation, receiving oxygen. I think that that's an important one to recognize, especially high doses. So when you're thinking surgery, like anesthesia, scuba diving, the incidence of pulmonary toxicity has occurred in about 10% of patients who've received bleomycin. It can present as cough, or dyspnea, fibrosis, hypoxia, and kind of also manifest in the other extreme as fibrosis or pneumonitis. What we're monitoring here is PFT, which is a pulmonary function test. We're looking for that at baseline. And in that test, specifically, we're looking for this value called DLCO, which is the pulmonary diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. 
Ideally, a baseline DLCO of at least 60% is acceptable for the use of bleomycin, according to NCCN. And the package insert actually recommends monitoring this DLCO monthly or chest x-rays every one to two weeks. Clinically, I would say that's not very practical. But it's important to know that if you kind of detect some of these signs that this drug should be discontinued when DLCO falls below 30 to 35% of that pretreatment value. Another aspect with bleomycin specifically is idiosyncratic reactions. And it's kind of a fancy term for this like anaphylactic type of reaction. It could cause, you know, fever, chills, wheezing, mental confusion. Some institutions do do test doses. I think they're being kind of phased out now, though. And then there's this other issue of perhaps hyperpigmentation of the skin. So note that, you know, the skin and the lungs both don't have that bleomycin hydrolase. So, you know, it's these side effects are manifesting really because of that. So I think that's kind of an important factor there. Some other side effects for the other agents when you're thinking about dectinomycin, you know, hepatotoxicity. This agent is highly emetogenic, secondary malignancies with dactinomycin, mitomycin, perhaps, you know, low nausea, vomiting risk, but it has this side effect of hemolytic uremic syndrome, and also pulmonary effects or cardiac effects. And then trabectidin is moderately emetogenic and it has a unique side effect of rhabdomyolysis. So that's something that you really don't see in oncolytics. So you do monitor a CPK there. It also can cause drug-induced hepatotoxicity. And so here, the use of dexamethasone actually helps with the nausea, but it also is kind of helping reduce some of that incidental hepatotoxicity. So it's kind of a, working as double duty there in that, in that setting. You do monitor for echo for trabectidin and it's a vesicant, which requires a central line. It kind of has this dosing of 24-hour infusion which some institutions may require courts, you know, specifically for that. But the, some of the side effects also include capillary leak syndrome, as well as myosuppression for trabectidin. I know trabectidin has been very challenging because like, as we've talked about, it is a vesicant, it is a 24 hour infusion. And so how do we comfortably safely send patients home with a continuously infusing vesicant? You know, I think it was it's been challenging. We've overcome it, but I think there's always still a little bit of hesitation on behalf of the nurse of, are we really doing this? <laughs> Is this really what we have to do? And I think initially, you know, patients probably were kept impatient for that monitoring, but we've transitioned from that. So it is a very unique drug in that sense. Very unique. And I think with the day and age of, you know, these at home infusion pumps, we're getting a little bit more comfortable, but yes, you know, when those patients do come, everyone kind of takes a step back and wants to make sure that none of the hazards of having a pump at home are kind of in place. So along those lines, what are some considerations that nurses should keep in mind when administering anti-tumor antibiotics to patients? Thinking about bleomycin, it's um, IV over 10 minutes. And you want to think about the lifetime maximum dose. So when you are uh, working up your patient, that's something to kind of think about. Dectinomycin is highly metagenic, so making sure that there's antibiotics on board. Um, it's also a vesicant, so thinking about vesicant precautions. Cold compresses is how you would help treat that if it, there is an extravasation. Mitomycin is also a vesicant. There's an antidote called DMSO that can be applied, so kind of familiarizing yourself with the extravasation policies and you know the dosing. And then in kind of like we talked about, it's moderately emetic risk. And um, it's a vesicant, you know, making sure that central line is very accessible, and that if the pump, if the patient's going home with this pump, kind of making sure that all the right things are in place for them to have a safe 24-hour infusion. What are some of the primary patient education points that we should be communicating with, you know, patients, their families, their caregivers, specifically about their anti-tumor antibiotic drugs? Bleomycin, you know, this serious and fatal lung toxicity is really important to discuss. And the risk factors like smoking, vaping, or marijuana use, they all can perpetuate it. But if you experience shortness of breath or fatigue, it's really important to identify this. We've had, you know, in my practice, I've had patients with this kind of toxicity and identifying that versus, you know, a PE, this, they kind of look the same and present themselves the same. So it's really important to 
maybe get, get worked up and get to an immediate care as soon as you can. Um, also knowing that, you know, especially with COVID and things going on, receiving high dose oxygen actually increases that risk of pulmonary toxicity. So making sure that they know that if they are admitted um, for a surgery or things like that, that to let the provider know that they're on gliomycin. Mitomycin and dactinomycin, vesicant precautions. So, you know, letting the patients know that if there's burning sensation, let your provider know. Trebectidin, I would say nausea, vomiting, fatigue is a big one. Kind of identifying, helping them identify rhabdomyolysis. So maybe is saying that there's this could cause a breakdown of your muscles, which can be severe. You might have muscle pain or weakness or, or dark colored urine. And those are some of the highlights that I would educate about. Wonderful. So I, you know, we've had a great discussion today. I think it clearly shows that pharmacists and oncology nurses, you know, they must collaborate when we're dealing with these types of drugs and caring for patients who are receiving anthracyclines, anti-tumor antibiotics. So do you have any examples or maybe some best practices of how pharmacists and nurses can collaborate, whether it's managing adverse events and toxicities, providing that patient education, or just serving as that trusted source of information? Sure. So I can kind of talk about all of those aspects there. I think identifying that the type of adverse event is kind of important. So whether it's an acute or a chronic, so acute extravasation or chronic would be cardiotoxicity, you know, approaching lifetime doses. And the method of response can really be a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. And so communication, I would say, is the foundation of management. Our practice is unique in that we have clinic pharmacists that provide direct patient care. So patients are seeing these pharmacists and then the pharmacist can have a one-to-one conversation with nurses, with the healthcare providers, with the physicians real time to kind of help some of this decision making. I think one method is also going over policies. So whether that is, you know, reviewing policies or during a nursing meeting or education meeting, kind of going over the extravasation policy yearly. And then the other aspect that has really helped us, I I think, is maybe having some of these simulated training sessions. Actually, in 2019, our nurses and pharmacist team attended a workshop hosted by University of Michigan and used this live simulated kind of setting. But you are allowed to feel comfortable because you can manage some of these acute instances in a kind of a non-pressure environment. I would say supporting one another's professions, you know, nurses and pharmacists work so well together in our institution. There's great nursing support for our pharmacy practice residents that come through for oncology when they're doing their presentations. You know, often our education is based on what the nurses need. You know, what do you want as a nurse to offer to your patient? And then, you know, some will maybe create a presentation around that. And then in terms of trust, I think professionalism and cooperation is really important and kind of demonstrating that in the environment and really taking a genuine interest in your patient specific factors for them to build trust. I think trust is the foundation of oncology really because we are asking our patients to do so many things outside of our infusion center, picking up medications, taking medications, calling us about signs and symptoms, going and getting all these imaging, you know? So if there isn't that foundation of trust, having this perfect curative treatment plan may be more challenging to really be carried out. Absolutely. I think all of those ideas and thoughts are are certainly great information to take back to your own institution. If if you are working closely side by side, if you have pharmacists in, you know, in-house working to help support your patients, I think you've provided some great ideas of, of how to just make sure that that relationship and that communication continues to improve and evolve so that the patient is, you know, getting the best care possible. So we're heading into the end of this episode, but I'm just wondering, what do you think the future looks like for anthracyclines and anti-tumor antibiotics in their role in the landscape of cancer care? Sure. So we've developed these very powerful agents and they're non-cell specific. So I think the next step would be how can we reformulate them to make them less toxic and provide more of a targeted approach. And so perhaps an antibody drug conjugate that's specifically attacking the lymphoma or the breast cell can deliver this chemotherapy with a, a cytotoxic payload is, is there in the horizon. There is a, an agent called TDL1, which is um, a novel liposomal formulation of pegylated doxorubicin. It has this altered particle behavior to kind of decrease some of the uh, side effects, and it's in phase one studies. 
I think the other approach, you know, aside from formulation that we're looking at is really the is less is more kind of approach that we've seen throughout the oncology history of clinical trials, right? So gliomycin, for example, which is based on the RATHL trial um, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, we use more of a PET-directed approach now. We're determining to determine if we can remove the bleomycin and only give two cycles of it without affecting efficacy. And, you know, that has been proven over and over to be very successful. And so that's the approach that we're taking now. Wonderful. Well, lots of things, as we said earlier, this class of drugs has been here for a long time, likely not going anywhere anytime soon. But as you mentioned, opportunities to repackage, reformulate, and deliver these agents in perhaps a unique way so that the toxicities can be limited or minimized, but the efficacy can be preserved and patients can and hopefully live longer and we can make great strides in controlling the diseases that these agents are used for. Well, Pooja, thank you again for all of your time and expertise. I have certainly learned a lot during our discussion today. And as we wrap up our episode, we'd like to always ask a few of these quick fire questions at the end, just to help summarize some of the big topics that we've talked about. So to start that off, how do you think healthcare professionals should evaluate maybe their hidden or implicit bias about anthracyclines and other anti-tumor antibiotics? Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting question because you don't really know your own biases because that's something that has matured over a lifetime. And as we talk about these agents, you know, we're talking about cumulative lifetime dose maximums. I think you can think of implicit bias in the same sense that it's something that's been created over a lifetime. So it's going to, it really involves a great deal of reflection. One of the first things that you can do is take this, a test, it's called the implicit association test, IAT. It's housed at Project Implicits at Harvard EDU's website. It's the first thing that pops up in, on the Google search. There is no per personal identification data that's collected from individual test takers, but this test is really there to measure your and test your associations. So I think once you identify those, it kind of gives you this critical eye to understand the science of implicit bias. For the readers out there, there's a book and there's also an audio book called The Blind Spot. The Blind Spot, The Hidden Biases of Good People, uh, written by Dr. Greenwald and Dr. Benaji, and they were the ones that actually are credited for creating the IAT test. Then first, you have to kind of discover yourself. What's something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? I think the misconception that I will develop heart damage is really important. Dr. Rubison has the infamous name of the red devil, but I think it's important to let your patients know that heart failure increases with cumulative dosing, you know, teaching them, we're talking, them, talking to them about 300 milligrams per meter squared is, is associated with a, a 1.5 risk, 1.5% of heart failure risk, whereas going all the way across to 500 milligrams per meter squared, now you're looking at six to 20% of probability of developing heart failure. So I think having that upfront conversation to kind of help ease the patient. And then really understanding that not all chemotherapy agents cause myelosuppression. And I, I think bleomycin is unique in this and in, in that it's an exception that by itself, it doesn't cause myelosuppression. That's why we can use it with some of our multi-chemotherapy regimens. That's, and this highlights one of the pillars of multi-agent chemotherapy regimens. Using different drugs with different mechanisms with non-overlapping toxicity profiles is important. So I think those were some things that I would um, add. What's something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? We talk a lot about cardiotoxicity today at length. And I think that PI for doxorubicin doesn't really provide great guidance on how to manage left ventricular ejection fraction decreases, So, yet we monitor them. So I think taking the time and understanding the literature, typically we don't start these agents with LVF less than 50 to 55. There's some great review articles by JCO that kind of tell, define what cardiomyopathy decrease looks like and decreases in, in LVF over 10% to a value below the institutional limit of normal, I think is a nice point to have in, you know, as a value, a number to kind of work with. The other aspect is kind of reflecting and critically thinking about hepatic dose adjustments, specifically with doxorubicin. Doxorubicin can be dose reduced for t -bili from 1.5 to 3, 50%. Uh, but in the sedium lymphoma, when you're thinking about dose intensity, maintaining a dose intensity of greater than 75 is improved, is associated with improved survivals. So having that discussion of 
do we really need to dose reduce or are there other players or are there other circumstances? I think taking a look at a closer look at survival rates and increased possible toxicity and having those conversations with your pharmacist is important. What additional training or education do oncology nurses need to stay current about these agents? So working with your nurse educator and leader to help achieve OCN, the Oncology Certified Nurse Certification is really important. And I think live simulated experiences are are really beneficial. Maybe even looking at extravasations or having a doxal infusion related reaction. Because here in the acute setting, we're really kind of respond, we're in this like responsive mode. But if we practice, we can respond more deliberately and more calmly. And then finally, what are some additional resources maybe for patients or maybe other providers who want to learn more? So NCCN is a great resource. I think even for patients, it has a patient resources tab. NCI is fantastic for patient education. The HOPA ONS and and CODA and ECCP also have this partnership for this IV cancer treatment education sheets. And I use these a great deal in my practice and they have the schedule and you can save them. And then for providers, I think NCCN offers educational webinars that offers with CEs. And then for the podcast listeners, you know, Oncofarm podcast by John Bassar is a great kind of offers great reviews and then ASCO educational podcasts. Well, wonderful. Thank you again, Pooja, for all of this great information. I know that I've learned a lot today and you've provided some great resources for us to consider. Do you have any final comments to share with our listeners today? Well, I just I want to say thank you to Ones for inviting me. And I really tried to cover the kind of the high notes with pearls that I've learned over the years with practicing with patients in clinic and in the pharmacy. I would encourage listeners to look at the tables in the C. John publication as it was really designed for tools for nurses for side effect management. And, and Dr. Rubison is in that specific table there. And with that, I would just end and say, save the soil. You never know what you can grow. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Pooja. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.